guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. Lena Malik. I'm a urologist and female pelvic surgeon. And today I'm going to do something a little bit different than my usual. I'm going to react to a Grey's Anatomy episode. And this episode is back from season two. And I'm told there's a little bit of a urologic story here. So I'm going to watch, tell you how accurate it is, and give you some details on the science behind all of it. I hope you like what you see today. Make sure if you do, you give me a thumbs up and subscribe right there. And make sure you hit on the bell so you don't miss any of my episodes. I make new episodes every Monday. All right, let's go. There's a boy in my bed. <laughs> What's his name? Um, Steve. Where'd you find him? Joe's. Mm -hmm. That's where I am. Where? Burke's apartment. He went to the hospital. He left me here alone. You're going through his stuff, aren't you? Oh, there's no stuff to go through. It, it's a freak show. I mean, you can do surgery in here. <laughs> oh. He arranged his books using the Dewey Decimal System. Mayor, I'm scared. Get out. Get out of the house now. Who are you talking to? Uh, I, I gotta go. <laughs> So this is really funny. I think this happens all the time. I mean, girls call each other after any sort of jarring event in their life, particularly when they're dating new people or having new milestones in their life, like seeing their boyfriend's apartment for the first time. Oh. Oh, <laughs> and I shall name him Running Guy. <laughs> you know who I heard Alex come home with last night? You. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Actually, I really do want to talk about it, but he doesn't want to talk about it because there were technical difficulties. What? You know, he didn't, he, it was. No. Stop it. <laughs> you can't say anything. <laughs> George, stop uh, it. I, I'm going to at least think about making fun of him next time I see him. He said it never happened before. Oh, that's what we all say. And I mean they, that's what they all say. I don't know. Maybe this relationship just isn't meant to be. I mean, I just, just need some sex, George. You know, I just, I need sex now. You know what I mean? No matter how hard you beg, <laughs> I am not doing you. So this actually happened very often, men have performance issues, and this is totally normal. And what drives me nuts about this is that girls obsess over it, they need them. But really, you know, there's a lot of stress factors in having intercourse and having an erection. And particularly, there are a lot of psychological factors that can play into your ability to have an erection. And so really, if it happens once, especially when someone really likes you, I wouldn't get too worried about it. And I definitely wouldn't tell his guy friend or guy colleague, surgical resident, because that's not cool. Meredith? You work here? Oh, what are you doing here, Steve? I'm having a little problem. Steve's? Actually, I'm, I'm having a big problem. What? Steve, hi, Christina. E ever since you and I, it won't go away. Christina, what? It's right there looking at me. <laughs> oh, there's so many things I could say right now. Jam. What he has is a, what's called a priapism. And so that is technically defined as a persistent penile erection that can use four hours after or unrelated to sexual intercourse. And that's an emergency. So he really shouldn't be walking up to the hospital looking for people. He should be in the ER. And presumably he had intercourse with her at some point when it was still dark out. And if it's been now morning time, it's probably been about four hours. So he really needs to get attention right away. We were just bringing him up here because he's got this problem, you see. And he's a, a friend. What did your friend take? Take? Which erectile dysfunction drug? You took... Uh, absolutely not, I swear. It was all natural between us. Shut up! Your condition is called priapism, usually brought on by the overuse of EDs. I didn't take anything. But we'll have to take your word for it, because there's no test to see if you're lying. We'll have to look for other causes. There'll be lots of labs, lots of 
Procedures, painful procedures. Procedures which might make you wish you never had a penis. You sure you don't want to change your story? I swear I'm clean. All right, great. Start his work up. Get some blood, get him some aparitine for his pain. As of now, your friend is admitted. So many things wrong with that. So number one, he should be in an emergency room and not being evaluated by a general surgeon, presumably. Uh, this is typically managed when you have a priapism. It's typically managed by going to the ER. And a lot of ER doctors can manage this on their own, but oftentimes they'll call a urologist. Uh, number two, that response was completely inappropriate. You cannot tell a guy who has a priapism that and question them and interrogate them in that manner, um, assuming they took a medication because priapism isn't always caused by taking medications for erectile dysfunction. Yes, it can certainly be caused by that. And that's something that we warn patients about when we start them on medications for erectile dysfunction, that if you have an erection lasting longer than four hours and you need to come to the emergency room. However, there are other causes. Some of these include sickle cell disease, certain kinds of cancers like leukemia can actually have a malignant infiltration of the penis. Sometimes having nutrition through an IV like TPN can cause this problem. Certain medications like trazodone can cause an erection as well as cocaine use. And then also sometimes, very rare, IV contrast can cause a priapism. There's a number of reasons. Oftentimes we can't find a cause. It's important to treat these people with compassion, and, you know, they're scared and they're freaked out. This is a very sensitive area. You can't just tell them I'm going to be doing painful tests and procedures that are going to make you wish you didn't have a penis. I mean, that is just wrong. Hey. I'm going to take this opportunity to be somebody else. Dr. McGuire to admit it. Dr. McGuire. Steve's labs came back clean. So? So someone needs to induce vasoconstriction. Oh, nice try with the fancy word. He needs an enema, and the answer is no. I can't do it. Oh, come on. You've got a guy you pick up in a bar, see you naked, and you can't give him an enema? Totally uncalled for. Well, I am keyed up and cranky. I would do it for you. Oh, oh really? You'd give Burke an enema? Yes. Uh-huh. Maybe. <laughs> no, but that's not the point. Oh, uh, yeah. OK, here's how it goes. I do this for you, and you do every enema I'm assigned to for an entire month. Deal. We really don't want to do this. Okay. Treatment of priapism is absolutely not an enema. So let me just kind of go over the steps of priapism. When a patient comes with a priapism, the first and most important thing is deciding what kind of priapism it is. You can have an ischemic or low flow priapism, and that usually presents with an erect, very fully erect penis that is painful. Or you can have a non-ischemic priapism, which is called a high flow priapism, and that is where it's partially erect. It's typically not painful, and that often follows some sort of trauma. This guy appears to have a ischemic priapism. What happens pathophysiologically in these patients is they get an erection from one of the causes that we discussed and the blood rushes into the penis creating the erection and cannot evacuate the penis because the venous outflow is decreased. And so in that circumstance, over time, particularly after four hours, the tissues of the penis actually start getting hypoxic or there's not enough oxygen to the tissues. And if you delay this for over 24 hours, you can actually get irreversible erectile dysfunction and fibrosis or scarring of the penile tissue. The treatment typically is to evacuate the blood in the penis. If you're not sure if this is an ischemic or non-ischemic priapism, you can do a blood gas, which essentially means you take some of the blood from the penis to decide if this actually is ischemic, meaning there's less oxygen in the, in the blood gas, or it's non-ischemic. And that can help because the treatment options are different. In this case, we'll just focus on the treatment for ischemic priapism. The treatment for ischemic priapism is to actually numb the penis, and that's done with a penile block. After you numb the penis, you then start with injecting the penis on both sides with a needle and pulling out the blood actually from the penis itself. That's called corporal aspiration. And sometimes you can irrigate fluid into it to help clear out that blood. And that typically resolves the priapism in most cases. If that doesn't work, we then have to go to surgery to make a bigger shunt in the erectile tissue of the penis to get that blood out of the penis. So let's see what happens. I'm 
enema didn't work. Clearly the enema didn't work because that's not a treatment from prison. Enema didn't work? Enema didn't work. Oh. Oh, it was an excellent enema. So, what's the next step? A needle aspiration. Finally, they're getting to the needle aspiration. A needle. My penis. We have to drain the blood. So typically, you wouldn't just tell a patient you're going to do a procedure like that. You actually have to get what's called an informed consent. You have to have them talk to them about the risks, the benefits, the alternatives, and they have to verbalize that they understand those risks, alternatives, and benefits, and they have the right to say no or decide what they want to do best for them. So this would not be an actual situation that occurs. No way. No. Forget it. Then you're looking at impotence, penile infarction, or gangrene. So if you want it to fall off. No, no, I really don't want that. Then let's get to it. Again, informed consent. Not these are the things that you might have happened to you without any explanation. What goes up must come down. I feel nauseous. Just lie back, close your eyes, and try to relax. If I could relax, I wouldn't be here. I just gave him back the key. He'll be hurt. Well, if I don't use it. Well, then, if you had no intention of using it, you shouldn't have taken it in the first place. Oh, come on. Fishing a key out of a coffee cup isn't like some binding legal contract. Your boyfriend gave you a key to his place? Why is he talking? I'm just saying, the guy put himself out there. He's taking the next step. You can't not use it. Do you think you might not be in the best position right now to be handing out relationship advice? Hey, he offered the key. You took the key. Just because I'm... Look at that. Congratulations. You're flaccid. Never thought I'd be so happy to hear that. All right, so they're doing the procedure, which is great, but it's honestly very, very common there. And the weirdest part about it is that they're both having a personal conversation right in front of the patient. So that is really not appropriate. I mean, this is a big deal to this person. And granted, Meredith kind of knows this guy. It's still really inappropriate to have a personal conversation while you're actively doing a procedure on a patient who's wide awake and probably, again, really freaked out. Oh my God. Lucha. Don't tell me. The flag is flying once again. Hey, nothing I did. Well, we've tried everything, so it must be neural. Neural? She already called for a consult. A consult? You called Nero for a consult? Hey, it's not my fault you broke the boy's penis. <sighs> Hello, everybody. What's up? So this is not something that would really happen. You would not call a neurosurgeon without any imaging, without having any idea because priapism, again, can be caused by idiopathic reasons. So typically, if you were suspecting a neurocot, which is again, extremely rare, you would get an MRI of the spine to see if he actually had a lesion. But before I did all that, I would again try to irrigate the penis. And if that didn't work, we'd have to go to surgery with presumably a urologist to then do a shunt, like I mentioned earlier. Calling a neurosurgeon would be a much, much later down the line thing and certainly wouldn't be something that would happen in this emergent situation. So when did the I mean, does he even really know what he's looking at? He typically takes care of the other brain. Did this um, problem begin? Well, I, I had an erection last night and woke up with one this morning. Uh, Dr. Shepard, if you don't need me, the other Dr. Shepard needs a consult on one of the quints. Yeah, no, no, we're fine. So when did you last ejaculate? I'm not sure. <sighs> Meredith? <laughs> oh, I'm... I'm gonna go with Dr. Bailey. Meredith. What time did we, uh, uh, Awkward. you know, yes, Meredith, what time did you two? So awkward. Your CT shows a tumor on your lower spine, which is pressing against your cavernous nerve, which is causing the erection. A tumor, right. A, a tumor. So I should be scared. Right? This is, this is the time for, for scared. Um, it's going to be fine. 
Um, Dr. Shepard is, is gonna schedule a surgery. Yes, I'll remove the tumor and everything should return to normal. Normal, normal. Well, I have a urologist on his way up to talk to you, but yes, normal, normal. Can you call my mom? Her number's in my wallet. Tell her to come, but, but don't tell her about the tumor. I don't wanna freak her out when she has to get on a plane. Sure, okay. How long have you two been seeing each other? We're not seeing each other. We met last night at Joe's. Joe's bar? Mm hmm I met a girl there once myself. Very long time ago. So finally, they mentioned calling a urologist. But again, a CT scan is not what you would use to look at spinal imaging. You would order an MRI. And if this were a tumor causing a priapism, it would be extremely rare. And you'd probably go through all the steps of reducing the priapism, as I mentioned earlier, take them to surgery, and ideally that would cure the priapism, and then they may develop what's called a stuttering priapism, at which point you would probably then go on to further do some spinal imaging and find this problem. Stuttering priapism is when you have an erection related to priapism that goes through detumescence, so it becomes flaccid, and then later has a recurring priapism again at a later date and lasting for again longer than four hours hey hey guess i'll just have to tell you i'm happy to see you <laughs> so dr shepherd removed the tumor without any complications so i just want to thank you for being there for me i mean normally you don't expect your one night stand to stick by you through a tumor Maybe when I get out of here, we could... I don't think so. Sure about that? Yeah. You know, when I saw you at Joe's, I was just... looking for a replacement. Looking for something to make me feel better. Hmm. And you deserve better than that. So I'm glad he's better. Despite not seeing a urologist on the show, they brought up priapism, and they did portray it in the show, so I'm happy that they brought up this problem. But they really didn't do it justice. I wish they had talked more about how much of an emergency it is, how uh, serious of a problem it can be. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to comment below. Let me know if you have anything else you'd like me to react to or any specific episodes or shows. And always remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.